Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Chris Rossiter of renegade edc and renegade provisions company now i heard about chris's work producing and selling edc gear especially custom made hanks and other hanks uh, but he really came onto my radar when he took renegade provisions into the knife territory with a big beefy yet hollow ground and i assume finely cutting bolster lock named after odin's spear there aren't too many designers out there making four inch bladed knives so that really made me sit up and take note that's my wheelhouse and now he's got a very easy on the eyes EDC knife on the way named after the god of mischief himself. We're going to find out how he got into the EDC game and where he's going to take uh, this knife career. Uh, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when new videos are uploaded. Uh, also, make sure you download the show to the podcast apps so you can listen while you mow the lawn, which you need to do. And uh, also join us on Patreon where you get exclusive content, like a little bit extra of the interview we're doing tonight. And then also knife giveaways and other stuff. Quickest way to do that is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and sign up. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Are you looking for a book about knives or knife collecting, knives and self-defense, or the yearly knife Bible filled with hundreds of pages of information and pictures about your favorite knives? Shop at theknifejunkie.com slash books for your traditional favorites, new books about knives, and the yearly knife Bible. Get your favorite knife book and support the show at theknifejunkie.com slash books. Chris, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, it's my pleasure. Uh, so like I said right up front, um, the the Gungnir, how do you pronounce that, first of all? Gungnir. The Gungnir. Uh, is, yep. Man. And that's uh, this beautiful hefty knife here. Oh, yeah. So that thing really, really grabbed my eye. Um, it, it's a very uh, bold design, uh, the shape of that blade. Everything about it, the size. I was very thrilled to hear the size of that. Mm. Um, but before we get to that, how did you get into this EDC selling game? Tell us about Re uh, about Renegade Provisions Company. By the way, a very cool name. Uh, yeah, it, it thank harkens you. back to something classic. Yeah, and um, Renegade Provisions Company. The the naming process actually came from a um, an Instagram group that I'm part of called the the Grog. It's a small group of guys uh, that we we try to delve deep into. Um, the iconography, the imagery, uh, backstories of things. We, we talk to various makers. You know, it's a, just a real good group of guys um, that have kind of a, a classic mindset. So we're, we're always talking about delving into the, the psyche of men and, you know, the kind of the root problems of the world and things like that. Um, so I started out as Renegade EDC, and I was very quickly finding that my side gig of making handkerchiefs was turning into more of a complete side business. And I wanted to diversify my Renegade EDC page, which was kind of like my personal face of the Renegade um, line, you know, what I was doing in the day, what I was cooking in the day, what I was carrying. Uh, and I didn't want to focus so much on the business side of it and kind of pollute all that or try to meld it together. So I started brainstorming different things that I wanted to do and um, renegade and savagery and chivalry. All of those were kind of like a, a word brainstorm that, that came together. And as we continued to whittle down things, uh, a good buddy in that group, uh, MB wild said, you should make it a provisions company. It's like, you know, don't, don't limit yourself to just handkerchiefs or whatever EDC gear that you'd want. He's like, you do beekeeping, you do, all kinds of stuff. He's like, don't limit yourself, make it a provisions company. And renegade provisions company was, was born from that. So beekeeping, are, are, are you beekeeping Hanks uh, now knives? Uh, I, I noticed on your website that you uh, do beard wax, uh, mm -hmm. which half the year will come in handy to, for me. Yeah. So uh, a very diversified uh, 
a bunch of products there. Obviously, there's a real love for knives. We're going to get to that in a second. And and I mm -hmm. bet if I were a Hank expert, I could I could identify a real love for Hanks because uh, because of all the amazing, beautiful designs and everything uh, that I saw there. But I'm interested about this Grog group. Uh, so you're not mm -hmm. just talking about EDC stuff. You are talking about um, uh, like the meta issues of man, basically. You're yeah, it's it's really just a it it was born from from EDC. That's that's all of our common interest. Uh, but it goes a lot a lot deeper through that. So we we may go from talking about um, just a couple of days ago we were talking about edge geometry and the and the differences between flat ground and hollow ground. Can a well can a well done nice thin flat grind be competitive to a hollow while still giving edge rigidity and, and strength. Uh, and we went from that uh, to talking about fatherhood and what that means and what that brings out of us in men, what it changes in our personality, in our hormones, in our, um, in our wild spirit kind of thing. So it, it's, it's like a men's book club, EDC club, um, psychology lounge where we can kind of go in and vent a little bit and uh, get some some input from some fellow men of of all age ranges because i think we have guys in there from from like upper 40s lower 50s all the way down to to mid 20s so we've got quite a a demographic of people in there so it's just a it, it's kind of the the bar throughout the day where we're not drinking but we're just enjoying the fellowship <laughs> of of other yeah. guys I mean, that sounds like a real welcome uh, kind of environment for a lot of people, a lot of men this day and age. Uh, some version of that, you know, I live in a house full of girls and women and and even a female cat. And sometimes the dog and I, we just repair to the basement and wonder what is going on up there, man. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, but uh, yeah, I love I love the idea. So, I mean. We talk about this a lot on the show. What what do knives mean? And and right now, for the purpose of this conversation, we're we're going to expand that out to EDC for a second. What does EDC mean? I mean, for me, I feel the love of knives is is not just a man and a uh, man or woman thing. I think all people have an innate love of knives. I think it's part of our, mm -hmm. um, you know, part of our genetics at this point. Um, it means yeah. it's a it's a it's a tool of hope. It's a tool of of utility, um, and there's a lot that goes into it. It's already in us, but the EDC everyday carry dad, if my father's listening, he's like, what is this EDC that I keep my everyday mm -hmm. carry the stuff you carry on you to make sure you can get through your day with the least resistance. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, that's basically what it is. How do you define it for yourself? And what are the kind of things you're looking for, for renegade that, how do you want those things to integrate into people's lives? Well, EDC to me really just boils down to what am I going to carry through the day, like you said, that's going to make my day easier. So my primary profession is a is a building inspector based in civil engineering. So I'm I may be crawling in crawl spaces, attics, going through a house from top to bottom. So I may need a flathead screwdriver through the day. I may need my pocket knife to cut, um, say somebody painted their attic scuttle shut and I have to score that paint to be able to open that door up. Um, I get into a dusty attic and I got to blow my nose. So I need my handkerchief. Um, it just boils down to what am I going to use on a regular basis? I have to use a flashlight five or six hours a day. So a flashlight's going to be in my EDC, a knife, a pry bar. Um, I just recently exchanged out my pry bar for a uh, Swiss army knife, uh, to try to test that out and see how it equated to, uh, my everyday needs. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's just something that makes you, makes your day easier. Uh, even when it comes down to if you don't need a knife, you could have something as simple as a as a challenge coin or a worry stone. Do you have uh, nervous issues? Do you have attention issues? Do you need something to fidget with to be able to occupy your mind just enough to pay attention in your meeting? You know, you know anything like that. Um, and as you as you go down through the the page, there's there's quite a um, quite an assortment there. So when I look at my when I look at my shop. Um, it, it may be something that I'm super interested in, like, uh, the breakdown mats. Uh, I really have a lot of fun, you know, breaking down my, my pistols or breaking down an optic, breaking down a knife and having a nice leather, um, base to organize everything and then be able to customize it. However, I, I want, 
same thing with the handkerchiefs. We have and just a immense gap in in all the people that are out there that use handkerchiefs. So I have the the wool handkerchiefs that I just recently came out with. So like this is the this is the super classic uh, line, and you know for people that want that that classic carry that works out very well. But then you go into all of the younger guys, and there's anime characters, there's childhood cartoon characters. Uh, the other day I had somebody uh, make a request. He wanted a, a Shaggy and Scooby <laughs> handkerchief with the with the mystery machine in the background, and uh, then you have all these other guys. Uh, I've got a whole section of collaboration hanks like the MB Wild and the um, the bite from um, Niche Designs. Oh yeah, uh, Primo with the Swanson. You know, so there are a couple of artists in there that that collaborate with me and and do work. So it's also ways not only to get my product out there, but to collaborate with other people and help them grow their audience as well. So that there's a little bit of everything in there for everybody. And you can give one to your kid. You can give one to your, to the missus, give one to the girlfriend, the dad, um, it try to cover everything. Yeah. I'm going to have to, I, I carry every day have for years, a folded up bandana in the back pocket. Mm -hmm. I think I need to up my game a little bit, you know, I'm yeah, seeing all those beautiful patterns. And that's how I started out too. Um, I was raised by my grandfather, um, the same one that, that built this, this house. And mm -hmm. he always had a handkerchief in his pocket. So as I started kind of growing up with him and working with him, um, I have really bad allergies all through the summer. So he gave me one of his old red bandanas and I started putting it in my pocket every day. And then as time went on, I thought, well, I, I can make this, I can, you know, get something a little bit more rigid because those handkerchiefs, they kind of fell apart. Um, mm -hmm. when you work in the construction trades and you're up and down and in and out, they end up getting oil stains on them and ripped and torn. And yeah, they're very thin so, already too. Yep. Yeah. Wanted something a little bit more sturdy. Uh, so just a couple of years ago, I thought, well, I can make these. I'm sure I can make these myself. I can figure it out. Got on the sewing machine and, you know, I think it's just two years ago that uh, that, that whole endeavor started. It sounds like uh, you are um, the kind of person who... Um, has a real appreciation for the classics. Um, uh, like for me, when I was much younger, I thought when I'm older and I have to shave, it's going to be a straight razor or nothing. That's what a gentleman shaves with, you know? Yeah. Uh, I've are... got a collection of straight razors ah, and safety yeah. razors. Yep. <laughs> nice. All kinds of different soaps, bore, bore bristle brushes. Yep. That, that nails it. There, there are so many really cool, um, uh, high quality classic, items that have kind of gone away uh a sacrificed on the altar of modern efficiency that mm -hmm. that i think really should be in everyone's lives still uh for instance if you use a straight razor to shave and i don't recommend it certainly but uh you do take your time that is for sure and uh, we we tend not to do things like that so uh, it's i i love hearing that you know that how how the uh how the hanks got started it, it all seems like it started from a desire to keep some masculine traditions going. And mm -hmm. I really, I appreciate that. Yeah. And it mixing from the, the keeping the classics alive and, and kind of bringing them to a new generation. There are a lot of things that we, you know, like you said, it has, it's broken way to, to modern ease of use. So instead of using a handkerchief, we use a paper towel and then we right. throw that paper towel away, which is a, a waste product. Um, and then there's no kind of, you know, what do you do with that? It's just a roll of paper towels. That's it. There's a lot of that classicness where I feel like it's almost like we're self pampering. So if we talk, we relate back to the straight razor. When I go to my barber shop and get my haircut from the 1940s, uh, they still have the steam towels. So when they line up my beard, they put the soap on, they wrap my face in the steam towel, they take it off, they wipe the soap down, then they put a gel on and they straight razor cut. And it's just, it's that relaxing extra five minutes of the haircut where I close my eyes, you've got a hot steamy towel on your face and you just kind of want to fall back and asleep into like a dream state. Or you can get just a normal haircut where they zip, 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 cut, cut, cut. 
out the door and there's no kind of pampering. There's no kind of connection with you and the, the barber or great clips, wherever you, you know, wherever you go. Right. Right. So bringing back that classic barbershop feel, bringing back the, the pampering of a, a nice quality handkerchief. Uh, it just makes you appreciate yourself and what you're doing that little bit more. Yeah. And, and like that moment, just that moment. Yeah. I'm blowing my nose or I'm, I'm rubbing my eyes or whatever you're, you're doing with it. I mean, I use my hanks for everything, cleaning oh, my yeah. glasses, but I'm doing it with this beautiful thing. And mm-hmm. this is going to be with me for a long time. Um, as opposed to that paper towel that I could have jammed in my pocket. So yeah. all, all, all that being said, how did it, how did it come to pass that you decided to go into folding knives and have you always been a knife person? Oh, I I've been a knife person since I was old enough to walk. Um, my, uh, like I said, my grandparents raised me. So pocket knives were introduced to me very, very early on because my grandmother carried one to do gardening. My grandfather carried one to do, all the tasks uh, through the work day that, that he did. We were avid fishermen. Uh, so we always used them for, for cutting line and doing whatever else that we needed to. So I think um, it wasn't long after I started potty training that I ended up getting my, my first knife, which was an old timer um, nice. that I had found walking with my grandmother and my grandfather had taken a file and kind of filed down the edge. So it wasn't sharp, but it was still a knife. Um, and that just spawned, a, a lifetime of wanting to be uh, a knife person. So I, I collected knives all through my childhood, uh, then got into kind of more practical blades. And then as I hit like my, my mid early mid twenties, I started going into the, what I thought was higher end at that point in time, you know, branching into Benchmade and Spyderco, um, getting some of those steels that wasn't 1095 or just blanket stainless from, from Walmart. Uh, and it just snowballed from there. So spider co knives turned into, uh, bench made turned into, uh, Microtech and Marfione and then turned into Brian Brown and, and all of the makers that we know and love, uh, today. So then you decided it's time for me to design a knife or something yeah. like that. How did that happen? And, and how did you come up with the first design, the gung near? Um, well, I started into, um, the design and again, that that's where the grog group, uh, comes in, uh, to play. I was just kind of, uh, doodling at some point in time, we were all talking about, you know, what we liked about certain knife designs, what we didn't like about them, um, how kind of not throwing any kind of shade towards anybody in the knife industry, but how every knife kind of had a shortcoming in some way, shape or form. So if I wanted it for this task, it didn't do this task. If I wanted it for this one, it didn't do the other one. Um, and we, we just kind of got into what's our favorite blade shape, how, how would it look? And it was like a creative spark just kind of popped. And I was sitting there with my grid paper and my protractors and my radiuses and drafting pencils. Uh, and I just went to town drawing. And a few hours later, after being silent in the group that whole time, I kind of popped back and I was like, Hey, here's my, here's my uh, rough draft knife design. Everybody was looking at it. We talked about it for a long time and a couple of them kind of sent me personal messages and were like, you, you should really pursue kind of perfecting this, drawing it out, making it functional and, and see where you can go with it. And then that's where, you know, gun near started. So I designed a knife that I wanted to, for work, I wanted something that was hefty. Uh, I've got relatively big size hands Um, I wanted something that fit in my hand. Well, I wanted something that carried well. A lot of times when you get into these bigger high end knives, you almost always have the, uh, the milled titanium clips and wire clips are kind of not a, not an option on a lot of, um, especially the bigger knives and at the higher price points. Right. So I thought, well, I want to offer something that has multiple clip options. Um, and I know all the lefties out there are going to, you know, still be, ridiculing me that they're not double-sided they're not reversible yet um but i i just kind of designed the knife that i wanted to to work with on a daily basis something that had a nice sheep's foot design and a a large belly the hollow grind to make it nice and nice and slicey um 
but still a nice, durable knife that I could use with a pair of gloves. I could use in the dirt and the dust uh, and just really beat the beat the daylights out of. Has the design lived up to your initial um, goal design goals? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've I've been very, very happy with with the knife uh, as time goes on. And I kind of um, have cut my chops on on designing. And like I said, I do have a background in in engineering. So it kind of helps to 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 make the base design. But there are so many nuances that you don't really think of as you're designing the first one and the the second knife design and the third knife design. They all kind of better themselves as time goes on. So the, the gun near, I, I carry it almost every day still when I'm not carrying one of my other prototypes, uh, I still use it constantly. Uh, this one's in need of a good sharpening. It's hard to see, but there's some chips oh, nice. in the blade. Uh, I've been doing electrical wiring with it, drywall, uh, with it. Now that we're starting work outside cutting, um, cutting CTS pipe, like underground, airlines and water lines all kinds of stuff your your so job is is perfect your job is perfect for testing <laughs> out these knives man because uh you know it's i, I don't want to say it's uh, nothing about this is easy but but one could make a design that looks good uh you know easy on the eyes send it to a company that you know is going to knock it out of the park and then just say here here's my here's my hard use knife but you're actually uh you know taking it out and um using it hard and it's mm -hmm. and it's working out and th that's the that's a great way to test it you know oh yeah yeah and i i think that there are probably going to be people out there that that hard use it even more than than me um but this is a, a topic that i've i've brought up in multiple chat groups that i've been part of is that I've I've carried just about every knife maker out there and every time I pick up a new knife it looks mint for about 8 hours <laughs> and then it goes to it goes to a job site or it goes to the yard um and and a lot of those people on Instagram they'll see the kind of abuse that I'm putting a a $1000 sheer gurov through and they're like kind of grimacing when they when they see the not necessarily abuse I'm just using it for what it is it's not like I'm taking it and using it like a pry bar, which is why I carry a pry bar separately. You don't pry with your knives, um, but doing just the standard cutting tasks and trying to, to put that edge geometry to the limit to, to see what it's going to do and then figure out how comfortable it is to carry while you've got a, a work bag on your hip or while you're carrying a toolbox, while you're carrying a ladder over your shoulder, um, just making sure that that functionality is, is solid. I think that's the huge paradox of collecting expensive knives, really nice knives. Um, I tend to get precious with them. Um, mm. Not that I have too much opportunity. My job and my lifestyle doesn't call upon me to use my knives hard uh, mm. in, in the least. Generally, I, I have to go looking around for things to, to do with them, uh, to be yeah. honest. But in any case, uh, you know, you spend um, time stalking a knife or, you know, um, hunting a knife down and then mm -hmm. you, you save up and you spend the money and um, or however you come by it, it's, it's usually a process. And oftentimes by the time you get it, it's something that, that ends up on the shelf, the gun mm -hmm. um, you know, because you want to protect your, protect your precious, but, but the gun near is um, man, it, it's got uh, from now I have not handled it, but from what I've seen in the many, many pictures, and videos is that it is a premium and luxury creation in that it's titanium and micarta and m390 blade steel <clears throat> really nice design and a really excellent hollow grind uh mm -hmm. and and yet it is uh it is perfectly at home in the kind of environment you're talking about and i i think for a knife like this that's a really great balance oh yeah yeah and you as a designer, you want to design something that that kind of fits as many people as possible. And myself in in knife designing with my first knife, I really kind of did the absolute opposite. And uh, with a lot of people, um, because they said, you know, like, maybe you should maybe you should save the four and a quarter inch version of it for like your third knife run. Uh, but 
releasing the big one to start off with was kind of something to prove to myself that the, I thought if I could launch this one and be successful with the the big boy, that there would be a little bit easier time doing the, the rest of them. So as I came out with additional designs that it would just get a little bit easier and I'd kind of get the the hard stuff out of the way at the be at the beginning. Um, because a lot of people can't carry a knife that's this big legally uh, in some areas that they live. And then a lot of the people that can legally carry it don't want to carry a knife uh, that's this big. I was just trying to figure out, I don't have anything much on my desk other than the Luft Concepts Avant, but there's a significant <laughs> difference in the, in the two sizes. So it's, wow. it's not a small knife uh, in any manner, but it is nice and thin. So I tried to make a big knife that would appeal to somebody that, you know, say had a maximum use case of three and a half inch or three and a quarter and three and three quarter inches uh, that they would kind of look at this and be like, it, it, it's manageable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that I figured that would be the hardest one to, to launch. Well, I think I think you're right about that because most people, you know, shy away from the larger blades, but it hasn't seemed to really stopped anyone from from getting that knife. People seem to be crazy about it. Um, and yeah. so uh, I think you're right about, you know, it's an interesting way to go about it. Do the hard part first. And if that catches on, well, damn it. I know. I know everything else will. Um, yeah, it's so, that old adage that you eat your vegetables first and you yeah. save your dessert for last. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when in reality, that's kind of my dessert first, that four and a quarter. I mean, I was like, man, it's over four inches. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that That's very pleasing to me. So uh, what else is pleasing is you went with a uh, bolster lock. And I have mm -hmm. recently, I've always kind of, you know, oh, yeah. But recently, I've really been um, recognizing the benefit of bolster locks because I tend to fat finger flippers um you know, mm -hmm. enough. And, uh, especially if it's something small and slim, that is not the case with this knife, but, um, but in, in many cases, especially with flippers, um, why did you go with the bolster lock? Uh, well, the, the first reason is that that note into the classic knife. Um, so if we, if we look back into, you know, more classic lockbacks or classic slip joints, uh, you see a lot of that kind of bolstering imagery. So you, you would have a, a slip joint and it would have um, the nice chunk of metal at the end and maybe a nice chunk of metal at the end. And then you have that scale that goes in between. So when I look at a bolster lock, it, it reminds me of a, of a simpler time where we treated our tools a little bit differently. You know, it, it was a tool. It was something that was used. You picked your fingernails with it. You whittled a piece of wood with it. You you cleaned out the, the gunk from your tobacco pipe with it. You know, it, it was something that just was there with you all day, every day. And it was like another finger attached to your body. So when I look at a modern knife made into a bolster lock, it gives me that same kind of imagery. It reminds me of that, that classicness, that manliness, that masculinity, um, and just, brings home the fact that this is a, a tool. It's there to be used. It's there to be implemented in any way that you can see fit. I like that you're talking about uh, the bolster lock in reference to or parallel to slip joints and the bolsters on older knives. <clears throat> that, that didn't occur to me until you mentioned it right now, but uh, I do remember early on uh, when, um, when frame lock knives became very popular i remember thinking it they look incomplete you know on the show side mm -hmm. they look great you flip them over and it's like uh, oh it's like the the whole the veil has been lifted and we're just seeing the guts of it and and my eye is used to it now and i like what a lot of makers do to the lock sides uh, you know it's not always just a flat field of titanium now um mm -hmm. but seeing you know besides the utility of what i was talking about ease of deployment with a bolster lock to see the bolster go all the way around it can, makes it look like a more complete design mm -hmm. yeah and you know with only having a right-handed design currently a bolster lock also really allows someone that's that's left-handed to implement the blade uh, because if you think about it a lot of times that 
that lock bar is going to get in their way when they go to use that knife. Whereas in a, a right-handed person, it's, it's completely open and, and available. Um, you don't have that, that issue with the, with the fingers on the lock bar. Uh, one of the reasons I don't carry my Shirogor off is as much is because it's got that frame lock. That's just blatantly open on that, on that lock side. And every time I go to flip it open that first time and I slip my finger off and I think, well, that wasn't fun. So <laughs> then you, then you try again and it, it deploys. Uh, but there's always that first time when you pull it out of your pocket and you fail it and you just rip your finger down across that knurling on the, on the flipper tab. And you're like, okay, yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm going to change it in my own life. Yep. Uh, so I, I want to go back to, you have the design uh, of the Gungnir drawn out. Uh, you've you've kind of gone through different iterations with, with your group. And, and then there comes a time where you're like, oh, this is going to happen. I'm going to pull the trigger on this. Um, do you then learn, did you learn CAD then? Or do you, did you just get in touch with OEMs? What's it like wor working with OEMs and, and all of that? <laughs> um, well, I did learn CAD. Uh, originally in college. So I do have a, a background in, in understanding CAD and, and how to do it, but it'd been years since I've uh, operated any CAD program. So I did have to relearn a certain aspect. Uh, I did um, I did redraw the knife uh, from the the analog, the, the graphite pencil um, design over to CAD and got the moving pieces all together and, and where I wanted everything. And then um, then at that point, I started reaching out to, to OEMs and, and talking with them about uh, how the process went because I made the mistake of not talking to any other makers that had already produced knives mm -hmm. uh, and just went like straight on, like I'm going to blaze my own trail instead of using some information and some knowledge from other people that had already had already done it. Uh, so I, I only reached out to, to one OEM at the start and that was Riot um, because I'd had, dozens of Riot knives and could see a pretty stark difference between, you know, ones like Best Tech and, um, oh gosh, the Italian company, which is, it, the name just completely escaped me. Um, but Riot just seemed to have the, the pinnacle. Their hollow grinds were on point, their mm -hmm. micarta, their bolster transitions from scale to, to bolster uh, were phenomenal. Their inlays were phenomenal. And you could just see that there was just a competitive edge there uh, with all of their their work that they did. Uh, so I reached out to them first, got in contact, started conversations. Um, they asked for um, we signed a an NDA uh, both both ways so that I could send my design over, and both sides were protected, and uh, it just kind of all fell right into place. So I I just reached out to them, and that was that was it. Um, got everything together, pricing timelines, um, uh, sent in the deposit to get the, uh, to get the ball rolling mm -hmm. and then started the PR to get, um, to get the pre-order started. Once, uh, once you got prototypes, was there any design tweaking? Uh, or did they nail it right off the bat? How, how was the prototype process? Um, the, the prototype process was, was actually pretty, pretty good. There's a, there seems to be like a, a language barrier there. You know, you are talking to uh, a Chinese OEM and though they are speaking English, I think that there are some things that kind of slip through the floorboards, like the cracks in the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got the Gungnir prototypes, uh, I had engineered this um, cutout to always be a cutout. And the prototypes arrived with this just being a, a milled fuller on, on both sides. And even though the knife still, still worked, you could flip it uh, out just fine. It was a lot harder to do. It didn't have the, the ease of opening like it does with the, with the full cut through. Um, but outside of that, there wasn't much in the way of, of changes. We did a little bit of uh, change to the, uh, the swedge on the back. I added uh, captive pivot. Um, because when they uh, when they shifted out, the pivot was one of the things that I did not design in CAD. Uh, I just kind of put the screws in the places that they were supposed to be, did the exploded view so I could see, like, this is where the scale screws are. This is where the frame screws are. 
uh, and then they did the the alterations after that. So prototypes came in with a non-captive uh, pivot, uh, and that was something that I really felt it had to have. One at the price point, and then two at the at the functionality space. I didn't want somebody using this um, and having the the pivot back out because it's free spinning on both sides mm-hmm. and have that kind of complication and breakdown, maintenance, servicing, all of that. Um, but other than that, the the process was was pretty easy for me. Pretty okay. So with that captive um, captive pivot, I just recently had that. Uh, well, an issue come up with it wasn't an issue. It just uh, unexpectedly loosened the pivot on my uh, SoCom Bravo, you know, Reich made SoCom mm-hmm. Bravo. I really like the knife, you know, uh, but it immediately because, of course, I got it and I flipped it a billion times uh, and yeah, it like immediately backed up. Yeah. And and that was a little surprising to me. It's always kind of a buzzkill when you see you need two T20 Torx, uh, you know, bits to mm-hmm. tighten this up and get it and and get it down what uh besides the annoyance what uh you said in the price point uh, alluding to some sort of there's got to be some improvement in action what uh what about the captured pivot besides annoyance uh were you looking for or lack well, of to annoyance me, to me personally the ease of use and ease of maintenance goes into how much i'm going to use a knife so if it's going to take me a long time to take both of these pivots out, take everything apart, put it back together, and then get these torqued down, get the blade centered. Um, you know, you have all those guys that have YouTube videos out with every Spyderco knife, and they're shoving tissues in this side, and they're <laughs> yeah. torquing this screw, and they're torquing this frame screw, and like this is how you get your knife centered. If you if you just kind of have a, a solid design, you have that captive pivot, and when your knife is put together, when the pivot is still loose, all those tolerances are together, your knife blade is centered. Yes. And that's kind of what you want. And I think that it's a little bit harder, my personal thought, it's a little bit harder to get when you have a pivot that tightens from both sides. And then you have a collar on the inside that both of those pivot screws are are tying into. And you're kind of making that battle of torque between the two to then get your blade centered where you want it tight enough that you don't get blade play. And when you have a captive pivot, it's just, you tighten it down and it's done. Yes. Yes. Oh man. That, that back and forth trying to get it centered, you know, Oh, that can be (laughs) maddening. That can just, you know, that can just really bring you down or you loosen the wrong side. So you're supposed to only remove that certain screw and that's the one that you always remove, but you've removed the wrong one. Now you have to lock tight it and let it sit for 24 hours before oh. you tighten the other side. That Who wants to deal with that? Yeah. You, you wanna be able to just use your knife, service it, and then put it right back to use. Right, right, exactly. And and the whole thing about, oh, geez, I gotta tighten these body screws first and then move backward so that, mm. yeah, yeah. All of that stuff, that's, that's stuff of the past now. Um, yeah. All right, so you held up another knife that is stunning. Uh, pick it up. Tell us all about this one. Uh, so the the God of Mischief is actually my third knife design. Um, I decided to come out with this one um, before uh, the second one that I had drawn up, just because this one was such a stark difference uh, from the Gungnir, both in in size and general shape. So we've gone from a sheep's foot big hulking goliath uh, of a knife to more of a streamlined kind of um, mischievous hence the god of mischief um, warncliffe and with the design of this one i also wanted a nice functioning working blade Uh, so uh, something that i had implemented on the the gungnir was kind of this little um concave curve that comes up from the the spine of the knife so you can see if i hold it flat that this kind of curves up and then puts the jimping right up in a spot where it comes in contact with your thumb so if you're choking up uh, into the choil or holding it like this you've got good control of that blade and then with the god of mischief i kind of wanted to have that same thing uh, but give you kind of a a spear point or like a a spear tip geometry here. So you've got that same forward choke Mm -hmm. thumb placement, uh, but the same if you anchor back. 
And this one was just like a more refined fidgety worker knife um, that would fit in the pocket of a few more people. Yeah. So uh, 3.3 inches and a worn clip. This is <clears throat> kind of in the exact place it needs to be for a great EDC knife. I, I personally love mm. worn cliff blades. I love that straight edge. And uh 3.3 seems to be like just about exactly what people tend to like the most. Yeah, it, it seems about perfect. There's there's plenty of working edge uh, in this blade. Uh, and then there's plenty of room for this this forward choil to get your, your fingers up there for some nice intricate cutting uh, or just ease of use and comfort. And uh, yeah, the blade... The blade's about perfect size, really adds uh, to the, the action of the blade, uh, and it just feels perfect in pocket and just really disappears. The Gungnir uh, used uh, the deployment hole in the blade, also a flipper tab. This one has a deployment hole, but a top flipper or front flipper. Uh, yeah. what, what, are, what are the design challenges of that kind of um opening uh this is something that is still in its infancy you know mm -hmm. in the knife world and it looks like you nailed it what what were the well, design challenges <laughs> i'd like to think that that i nailed it and the uh the few people that have had the prototype in hand uh so far have given me given me positive remarks and then of course i've had this in in my possession for eight or nine months now uh so it wasn't too long after I had placed the order for Gungnir uh, that I placed the order for three additional prototypes uh, of different designs, um, which I think I placed that order about February of last year. Um, with designing a, a front flipper, uh, you want to have something that has functionality, but that also doesn't get in the way. Um, I don't happen to have any other front flippers here that would be a, for instance, of get in the way. Uh, mm -hmm. They normally come in and then they're right back out the door. <laughs> um, but I, over the last year and a half, uh, I've really fallen in love with how, how the, the front flipper functions, how easy it is to deploy, how nice it is when you have, so if I have like a big glove on in the middle of winter and I'm working, this front flipper is a lot easier to access in all manners of ways. So even if I can't get the tip of my finger on it, I can just roll the side of my finger and it opens. Whereas on a, a flipper tab, if you have a big heavy glove, and I never had the issue on the Gungnir, but you have that tab, Mm. sometimes gloves can make that a little bit complicated to to operate so the front flipper i think helps with that and then it's just a fidget monster so you you just want to kind of mess with it all day and try all the different ways to open it you know over the spine and, and then adding the cutout just kind of adds to that fidgety uh, how many ways you can open it play with it in any way shape or form uh, and then pretty much any sized hand with a front flipper works because you're not stretching your finger out. Mm -hmm. If you don't have much finger strength, the front flipper is a lot easier uh, to operate. The front or the uh, finger flip is always there for, for backup. Uh, back to your question, because I completely went off on a tangent. Uh, challenges in, in a front flipper. So I get started. You, you don't want something there that's so obstructive or sharp that when you jam it down in your pocket, it, it stabs into you. So you need to have some kind of rounding on it. You have to have a geometry that's pleasing and doesn't create a hot spot on the thigh, doesn't create a hot spot on your thumb when you're operating it, uh, but then also has plenty of lever leverage. Um, and one of the guys that I chat with uh, pretty often um, is Kevin, uh, who is known on YouTube as uh, Knife Nerd or Knife Nerdery. Um, he's always talking about the um, kind of the travel range, the range of motion that you have contact with that flipper tab before it disengages. And you can see here that as I kind of flip all the way up to the top of that bolster, I still have contact with this flipper. So it's allowing me to really get a good amount of pressure or torque and follow that all the way through the, the opening motion. A problem that I find with a lot of those front flippers is they'll have a tiny little stub up here and, you know, you'll see people flicking their wrist uh, to get that action because they want that 
torsion with their hand to add to the movement that they're doing with the, the flipper tab. But in my opinion, I'd really like to have something where I can just completely stationary, hold my hand mm -hmm. and open. So you want to make sure that you have enough movement or enough contact with the tab, but you also don't want to have so much that as you open it, that it hits your finger, yeah. which is a problem with some of front flippers. They have such a big tab that you can't kind of choke up here to this point and open it. Like I want to be pretty close up by the pivot with my finger and still not be in the way of that flipper tab. So you, you kind of have to get the perfect geometry on it, the perfect dimension so that you have enough movement to open the knife freely and without failure on a regular basis, um, but also not put it in the way of everybody. What is your timeline for this knife? Uh, this one is due in mid-November. Mid-November. Okay, yep. so is this, uh, So you indicated earlier that, that you do things on a pre-order, <clears throat> excuse me, a pre-order basis. And mm -hmm. uh, so are you doing the same thing for the, the, uh, the God of Mischief? Are you just calling it the G-O-M? Yep, um, GOM uh, is the what GOM. I've been uh, referring it to, kind of the pronunciation of the acronym, uh, but then the full name is God of Mischief. God of Mischief. Um, so yeah, either, either one's uh, perfectly acceptable. Um, what I did with these ones, I've been trying my best to shorten the pre-order timeline. And that's, that's probably one of my biggest complaints right now with a lot of the OEMs is they're pushing out farther and farther and farther. And, you know, the gun near was, I think ended up being 10 months, either 10 or 11 months from my pre-order date until I physically received them mm -hmm. uh, in the mail. So uh, once the gun nears uh, came in and everything was, was kind of done with them, I placed the order uh, for these, which would have been around February of this year. And then just a couple of Saturdays ago, the pre-order went live uh, for the GOMs. And even though I've placed my order in February, um, Riot's still kind of looking at that that end of the year. So we're still kind of on like a 10-month timeline uh, for for any production knives that are that are coming in through that company. So are they, is this, is this a, uh, an issue of, uh, a lot of knife, uh, knife makers and knives and companies going to, to Riot and the other OEMs, or is this a supply issue or. I think that it's probably a mix of, of a lot of things. Um, you know, following the news recently, China's getting hit with some pretty decent COVID lockdowns, which yeah. are kind of putting a halt to a lot of supply lines. So I'm sure that not only are the factories having to close down on certain, certain times or certain peaks in, in COVID. Uh, but every time Riot closes down, everybody that they use to produce um, the titanium, to produce the screws, to produce whatever else, they're closing down as well, which is then putting their timelines oh, out yeah. at the same time. So it's kind of a, a compounding factor where I think that they're getting a ton of knives um, New designers are probably coming into them, existing designers. A lot of uh, people that were making knives in-house are doing runs with, with Riot and Best Tech and, and all of those. Uh, so it's, it's kind of just a perfect storm of, of things kind of hitting them all at the same time. I think the thing that is, would be the most concerning to me is how um, public taste shifts and it, I, I don't, I, I can't say I have a number for the knife world. It seems like things turn over every couple of years. People, mm -hmm. uh, like the major movements of interest kind of shift. That is such a beautiful knife, man. I'm just looking at Thank Jim you. is, Jim is scrolling. I really, really, I mean, uh, I, I think it's a very nice looking knife and looks mean a lot to me when it comes to knives. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest. And yeah, uh, you nailed it here. Um, and, um, but I'm sorry, what I was getting at is uh, you design a knife and then you have a say you already have a relationship like you do with Riot. Um, but you got to get in line. There are a lot of people uh, who have who are. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a little stress about. Yeah, people love this knife right now. But in 10 months when it's manufactured, am I going to even love it? Because I know uh, with the creative stuff I do, uh, it takes me like an instant to move on and be like, okay, that's my old thing. 
and now I'm working on this thing. So yeah. does that time lag of, uh, bring undue stress, would you say? Um, I can't say that I've had that stress. Mm-hmm. Um, I could, I can definitely see where that would, would come from. Uh, but that also bears in mind one of the, the reasons why I designed the knives the way that I did with that more classic or what I felt was that the classic look with the, the bolsters and the scales. Um, anytime that you're doing something in business, you kind of look at, at trends. So, you know, take the, the stock market, for instance, where we've had that kind of catastrophic dip in the, in the past few weeks. But if you look at the stock market as a whole, it's, it's always kind of trended up, maybe more slow at some periods of time, but always kind of, of trended up. And you have to do the same thing in, in business. So when I'm buying handkerchief material, I'm planning right now the handkerchiefs that I'm going to be dropping in October. So I'm, I'm buying the fabric, I'm planning stitch color, I'm planning all of that stuff. And I may find out that I get to October and maybe orange wool isn't in at that point in time, but there's a pretty decent chance that orange wool is still going to be in um, around the October when, when the pumpkin spice crowd comes out. <laughs> so you, you just kind of have to, to weigh tolerance, weigh the changes. Um, you even have to think when you're looking that far out and you're working on the, the pre-order model, how is the economy going to change? Cause you've got a knife that somebody's paying up front for, and you're looking at, at being out seven to, to 10 months. Well, what's the financials going to look like at the end? I have a pre-order for this many knives, but I ordered this many knives. Uh, am I going to be able to sell those? So I can, I can see where a lot of stress would probably come, come from that, but it, you just got to do your math and then be confident in yourself and where you see the trajectory going. And as long as you've got that confidence, you just stick with it. Yeah. And, and you also have to be confident in your design and you as a knife lover and a lifelong user of knives and someone who uses knives in his daily uh, job, you are naturally going to have a good idea uh, about what other knife users want. And also, um, you know, what's good. You're not going to be doing crazy quartermaster designs if you're, (laughs) if you're, you know, just trying to get a knife out and, and get it in people's hands because yeah. that's crazy. And uh, in a month, people aren't going to like it. It's it, it might be yeah. a flash in the pan, but you better have it on hand to sell that moment. Mm-hmm. So what, what are you, what are you looking to do with renegade EDC renegade provisions company in terms of knives? I know you, you have a lot of other stuff you're going to sell, but the knife division, how do you plan on evolving that? Well, I think that the the next step, so like I said, I do have um, other models, other prototypes, which a lot of these haven't seen a whole lot of um, a lot of spotlight yet because I've been way behind the buck on um, kind of advertising them. But you notice that this is a gung near, uh, but not not the same size as mm-hmm. this one. Uh, so this is kind of what would be the consumer gung near. So compared to the GOM, you can see that they're very similar sizes. Um, I think now that I've kind of cut my chops and and got the the big boy uh, released and shipped out and and people like that design kind of launching uh, more of those will be the next um, the next realm in the the knives. Uh, and then I've I've always been a a maker a builder. Um, so when I come into anything, making the handkerchiefs, making leather goods. Um, I've got a lot of history in metal fabrication, contracting work, uh, used to build houses, remodel houses, things like that. Um, I think that the, the next trajectory that I'm heading for is uh, in shop manufacturing. Uh, and I've got building um, kind of in the works and materials picked out. Um, and it's just waiting on on time to be able to start construction of the shop area, get end mills, get grinders uh, in place. Uh, and I've been kind of soaking up some information from some local uh, CNC and metal guys to kind of get back into uh, that realm. So that's going to be um, production knives, I think, are still going to be a staple of the, the Renegade Provisions Co. lineup. But I'd really like to start getting into 
uh, in-house making, fabricating, customization. Um, so I think that's next, um, probably within the next 12 to 15 months. Damn, that's quick. That's very, very exciting. That's, yeah. uh, I mean, to me, it's very exciting that someone like you who's got a vision and some ideas for some good knives and, and other products, but for good knives that you can have them produced by a, you know, top of the line manufacturer and sell them. To me, that's very exciting. That's something that, you know, is relatively new. It's only been happening mm -hmm. for a few years, but what's even more exciting to me is hearing that you are not only dreaming about, but you're actually making it happen that you'll be able to make them yourself. And like mm -hmm. you said, I'm sure you'll have a bunch of, uh, you'll have OEM product too, uh, to fill the the uh, pages of your website. But uh, the fact that you are starting um, and will most likely grow manufacturing here is is really exciting. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people bring that up. You know, a lot of people are kind of like, yeah, you know, I have this great design, but it has to be made in China. And and I think most of us knife guys are are you know, we're more interested in the highest quality knife you can get. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 not so much about uh, but we all, you know, love where we come from, too. And it would be great to see the hometown, uh, mm -hmm. the home team winning on on that angle. So it's it's exciting to hear uh, that you're. Yeah. To and do I, that. I think that just about everybody that's in the production knife sphere right now, uh, at least in the group of guys that I'm chatting with on a regular basis that have made production knives. They're just itching for, for somebody in the U S to, to start doing it at a scale or at a point that is scalable to yeah. someone like Riot or best tech. And if there was an option out there for me to do say a, a smaller run of the gun near, um, at $50 more per unit or whatever it may be as, from a U.S. manufacturer, I'd have jumped all over it. And I did some research to try to see if I could find someone out there and you find on forums where this maker has a rumor like, ah, I used a American production company and yada, yada, but I can't share their name because they don't want to be blown up with business. I'm just like, well, where's this unicorn manufacturing yeah, yeah, facility yeah. Uh, that I, that I can't find. So I I've heard a lot of rumors about there being, um, being a few companies that are working on, raising the money to to get some of these big water jets and cnc machines to be able to to print out you know 300 unit batches or 400 unit right, batches right. of knives in a relatively decent timeline and the market is there if there's somebody out there that's willing to to do it they're going to probably be overrun with people wanting them to to manufacture their knives i think you're right i i think that uh the first, the big hurdle is the, you know, economics of it. And mm -hmm. then, and then once that's squared away, uh, we talked uh, to Josiah DeMille of uh, Millet Knives here a couple of times and, you know, brought that very thing up. You know, you're, you've got this OEM uh, manufacturing um, capability. Why are you not the, why are you not the Riyadh? You've got the, the mm -hmm. reputation. He's like, dude, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, he was very, gentle about it but he's like mm -hmm. look at the economics man we, we can't we can't do what riot does not mill it not right now um yeah but, but hopefully you know in the future people like you and 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 others yeah. um you know make that happen the the manufacturing prowess is definitely there in in america on our soil the the one part that i really see riot kind of pulling pulling a rabbit out of the hat, you know, making a magic trick happen is you think about how many people are just bringing them designs. It may be a 2D design. It may be a fully hatched out 3D CAD drawing. Uh, but somehow they're taking all of these people that are making these random designs and making functional knives <laughs> out of them. You look at American fabrication. You look at places like Benchmade. You look at Spyderco, Koenig knives, Hinderer knives. They're pumping out large and large amounts of knives but how many knives does koenig produce like different knives just right. a couple they've perfected just a couple and that's again that's not shade or anything because i i love my koenig knives they're absolutely fantastic i love my hinderers um, but they have a lineup that's this big 
of knives that they have done really, really good jobs of milling. And then you have Riot, who's taking a hundred different designers, creating all of their knives and getting very decently close to the manufacturing quality of these U.S. makers that are making three to seven knife designs, wow. not hundreds of knife designs. Yeah. And there, there's some kind of magicry that's going on there, whether it's from their their CAD engineers or from their milling perspective, but it, there's just something different kind of hitting home over there in their manufacturing that's allowing those that plethora of knives to come through and be functional, be smooth, be fidgety, be drop shutty, have good tolerances. That's a monolithic task of engineering. Uh, and I think it's possible over here, but there, there's just a little bit of magic that needs to come in to, to make that work. Wow. What a point. I, I, that has never occurred to me. Um, yeah. Yeah. They make a million different designs and they knock each and every single one of them out of the park mm -hmm. like they've been making it for years. Uh, yeah. All all of it, different geometry, all of it, different lockup, all of it different. That That is pretty astounding. Yeah. I, they, they say that uh, China graduates uh, more engineers in a year than we have engineers here, period. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it could be just a a. a a um, human Sheer effort. numbers game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, Chris, I want to continue this conversation uh, for a few more minutes. We'll let the patrons listen in. Um, but uh, we're just about mm -hmm. to wrap up here. Uh, I, I think uh, what you've done with the whole business is very interesting. I, I like, uh, I'm starting to look at how people are coming out with their knife businesses and the ones that, that have, well, in your case, more going it for more going for it than just knives or more going for it than just one model seem are, are very interesting to me because you're, you're seeing a whole branding process uh, take place across uh, a, um, a, across a range of products. And I mm -hmm. think that that's, uh, that's interesting and a, and a solid way of going about it. Um, it's, it's almost uh, like you're in so deep that that one knife, whether it does well or not, isn't an issue in, in a sense, mm -hmm. because you've got all this other stuff around you. Um, in any case, I think it's uh, two beautiful knives. And I have to say, uh, the GOM ha has has captured my heart. And then just seeing it in uh, in motion tonight was very cool. I think your designs yeah, you. are, are, are quite beautiful. So nicely done there, sir. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you and talking to you. And uh, well, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. It is my pleasure. Take care, sir. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Eating your vegetables first, doing the hard stuff first. Uh, we could all learn uh, a thing or two from Chris about that uh, very interesting conversation uh, go check out renegade edc renegade provisions company uh, for beautiful hanks really cool leather work and some brass work but of course i'm sending you there to check out the gorgeous knives the uh, uh the gung near you can you can get now and the um and the pre-order for the gum is now open. All right, that does it for this edition of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Be sure to download us on your favorite podcast app and listen while you do the stuff you have to do. Uh, check in Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, right here on YouTube, Twitch, or mm, Facebook. And also, you can zap that right there and become a patron, just like that, lickety-split. All right, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.